So recently we tested the 5D SR in the studio and we took some still life pictures, some portraits, and they looked really great. But we wanted to take it out and get some landscape shots, some wildlife, test the low ISO and see how it holds up against the 5D Mark III and the D810. Yeah, so I want to find out what it looks like at higher ISOs, what the dynamic range is like, and what if you don't use an almost opti optically perfect lens? What if you use like the 24 to 105s that we're all used to? Does that extra megapixels actually get you anything? So how practical are they? How practical is this? I guess we'll have to put it to the test and find out. Let's find out. If you want to get the sharpest shots possible, you have your camera on a tripod and you're using mirror lockup. Mirror lockup moves the mirror out of the way and waits a little bit before it takes the picture because moving that mirror up can actually shake the camera if you can believe it. Here's a problem, pushing the shutter button will also shake the camera. The Nikon doesn't put a delay on mirror lockup. That's a new feature with the Canon 5DSR. So I have to carry this external trigger. Not a big deal. Two presses of this gets me to take my picture, but the delay in the Canon is really nice. Comparing the 5D Mark III on the right to the 5DSR on the left, we can see significantly more detail in the 50 megapixel 5DSR. Let's zoom in all the way to 3 to 1 just to exaggerate the differences, but on the left here, the 5DSR's image just makes these fine details so much sharper throughout the image, even in the shadows, so much more texture in the leaves. So no, you don't have to upgrade your glass to see extra detail. Comparing the noise at ISO 6400, you can see that Lightroom processed the shadows a little bit differently. But overall, looking at the images, I see just about the same amount of noise. Keep in mind, we scaled both these down to the lower resolution. We scaled them both down to 22 megapixel 5D Mark III resolution. So while the noise levels are similar, maybe a hair better on the 5DSR, the 5DSR has far more sharpness and that can allow you to raise the noise reduction to further eliminate that noise. So here with the noise reduction increased, even scaled down to 22 megapixels, we can see the 5DSR images are still much, much sharper. And now with the noise reduction raised, they have far less noise. Let's boost the exposure to equalize the exposure in the shadow areas underneath this covered bridge. This allows us to see how well we can recover shadows and assess the dynamic range of the 5DSR versus the 5D Mark III. The 5 dsr shadows don't look substantially better than the 5D Mark III's, but they are far more detailed. Once again, we can trade detail for noise by raising the noise reduction. This reduces the detail, but eliminates the noise. We can see it's easy to retain similar amounts of detail with far, far less noise. In summary, the 5DSR's image quality is a huge upgrade from the 5D Mark III, even if you don't use high quality glass. Compare the detail on the 50 megapixel 5DSR to the 36 megapixel D810. Notice that I shot them both at their optimal ISOs. The D810 supports a lower ISO, and I scaled up the D810 images to 50 megapixels to make the comparisons more even. We'll zoom in and check some of these details out. This is zoomed in 3 to 1 for those of you watching in 4K. And looking at the detail entry, we do see substantially more detail on the 5DSR, even with a mid-grade lens. I do want to make a point, though. You can go in and increase the sharpening, and that seems to really close the gap. All I did was raise the sharpening. After raising the sharpening, we really couldn't distinguish much of a difference in a blind test. Sharpening doesn't actually extract more detail, but it really does visually make these two cameras look much more alike. Let's crank up the exposure in Lightroom and boost the shadows to check out how the dynamic range compares. Here under the bridge, we can see they both allowed us to recover quite a bit of detail. We can see the writing here and the texture in the wood, but the 5DSR definitely shows far more noise. The D810's shadows seem much well brighter and nice and smooth. Once again, we can trade some of that 5DSR's detail for noise by cranking up the noise reduction. And here we see similar amounts of detail and pretty similar amounts of noise. The D810 still has it by a hair though. Let's check the noise at ISO 6400. These have both been scaled down to 36 megapixels, just the most fair way to compare image noise. 
Looking at these greens, it actually feels like the 5DSR has closed most of the gap with the D810. The noise is almost the same. Again, we even at scale down to 36 megapixels, we do seem to see more detail and an uh, overall better image out of the 5DSR. Looking at the shadows here in the gray wood, we can see again the D810 seems to have just a hair less noise. The 5DSR seems to have slightly more detail. In summary, the 5DSR's image quality is a noticeable but slight upgrade from the D810, even with a mid-range zoom lens. Canon still can't quite match the dynamic range of noise, but it's easy to clean up the images in post while still retaining plenty of detail. This difference was more clear in the higher quality glass we used in our in-studio still life test. An articulating screen sure would be nice with this kind of shot, so I wouldn't have to get down low and on my knees when I want to work low to the ground and get something nice in the foreground. Another quirk with this Canon, mirror lockup doesn't work with live view mode for some reason. So I could compose it in live view mode and then turn it off and then turn mirror lockup on to use it, but can't we make that work together? It is just a beta camera. With this more natural scene filled with blowing leaves, moving water, and lacking sharp edges and textures, it was even harder to see any difference between the 5D Mark III and the D810. That means you'll appreciate the jump in detail more if you're shooting man-made type structures rather than more organic, soft-edged landscapes. Long exposures on running water make it very smooth and give it a feathery appearance. You can get that long exposure with a neutral density filter, which just blocks all the light by a certain amount. So instead of shooting at 1 30th of a second, you might be shooting at 1 second or 2 seconds. If you forget your ND filter, like I did, you can just take multiple shots of the scene. Then use a technique called image averaging to stack them all together. We showed you how to do that in another video, but it gives you the exact same effect of creating a long exposure without the extra gear. To stack the images, first open them as layers in Photoshop. If you were shooting handheld, or if you think your tripod might have shifted while shooting, select all your layers, then select Edit, and then Auto Align Layers. The default setting should be fine, this just lines up your images. Next, make sure your layers are selected. Go to the Layer menu, select Smart Objects, and then convert this to a Smart Object. This allows us to blend the layers together. Now, select the Layer menu, go to Smart Objects, Stack Mode, and Mean. This averages all the images, essentially extending our exposure by the sum total of the shutter speed of all the pictures. This effectively gave us a shutter speed of more than a second, giving us nice, smooth, flowing water. Here's another landscape photography trick. I loaded two images set taken at the same scene at different exposures. You can see this image has a nice blue sky and there's lots of detail in the tree here. It's all nice and sharp because I used a fast shutter speed. Here's a long shutter speed during which time the tree moved. The longer shutter speed also overexposed the sky. It's easy to make the best of this by blending the two images. I'll select this top layer and then turn on a layer mask. Any part of the layer mask that's white here shines through, so I actually want to paint some black over this to remove it. So I'm going to use a gradient tool here. And I want the top part to be white, so wherever I drag it, the top will be white. And then I want it to smoothly transition into blacks. Now you can see by looking at the layer mask here that it, the top part is white and the bottom part is black blending together the two images 
only using the top part of the sharper image so I can see the blue sky while still getting the pretty long exposure, making an image that's better than either of the first two images. Here you can see only the part of the image that I'm using from the shorter exposure. So the 5DSR, if you're in the Canon world, it's a huge step up from the 5D Mark III. If you're weighing between the D810 and the 5D Mark III, you can definitely get more detail out of that big Canon, but the Nikon D810 still holds up really well. A lot of people say, how many megapixels do you actually need? They always say, eight megapixels is enough for an 8x10, right? And who prints bigger than that? A lot of people. A lot of people do. And some of us just want all the detail we can because we enjoy it. We have fun with it, right? It's a hobby. You're supposed to have fun with it. And I love being able to zoom in really tight and look at all that detail. I also just want to say monitors are getting crisper and sharper and bigger. So you're going to be able to see that detail more in the future. And you probably want your pictures to be around for a while. Also, don't just look at the megapixels in the sensor and think that they're all going into your final picture because it's always the combination of the lens and the sensor. So, for example, if you use the very sharp 70-200 on the Nikon D810, even though it's got a 36 megapixel sensor. DxO Mark says it only gets like 23 actual perceived megapixels. So you're always working with something south. The sensor's megapixels just create a theoretical upper limit for the amount of detail you can get. But nobody has an optically perfect lens. More megapixels gets more detail out of even less sharp images. So keep that in mind as you're making big prints. And if you want it, you can't do better than it. So with all that said, the 5D SR is not a new camera. It's got one new piece, it's got a new sensor. Otherwise, it's still the 5D Mark III, which is like three, four years old and seeming kind of long in the tooth. It's got no 4K, it's got no touchscreen, no Wi-Fi, no GPS, no sensor stabilization. It's still got that 80s Casio LCD screen. Why would they put a screen from an $8 pharmacy watch on a $4,000 camera. It's getting ridiculous. This camera's looking real old. No electronic viewfinder. You just gotta use a modern mirrorless camera and then you pick up this dinosaur and it seems just silly. But the reality of it is you can't get any better images out of any other camera. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, give this video a like, and if you'd like to learn more, check out our book, Stunning Digital Photography. Thanks.